Hi, good morning, and uh, welcome to the ATEC 2021 virtual event startup competition semifinal. Uh, my name is Voon Lee, the ATEC programming co chair and uh, HBS uh, alumni of Hong Kong member. Um, I'd like to welcome our judges on screen today and everyone who's uh, attending. Uh, just a quick uh, a few remarks just about ATEC itself. ATEC was founded in 2019 uh, by the Great Bay Area University and Business School alumni clubs uh, from Harvard, Columbia, Stanford, and MIT. And ATEC believes that technology and entrepreneurship are the key pillars in value creation and are deeply rooted in the brands of the universities that our founding alumni clubs represent. So the mission of ATEC is to foster active engagement of our alumni clubs, either as startup founders, mentors, or invest investors. And central to this is the startup competition, which is an annual event that we hold that draws some of the most promising startups in Asia. So for today, today's agenda, we will be having a moderated discussion of the 13 semifinalists that our esteemed v, uh, VC judges panel helps us to select. Uh, then it will be followed by live Zoom voting by you, the audience, to determine who will be the final eight startups that will then progress to our live in-person conference later this year. Uh, we will have 30 minutes to vote. Oh, voting will be open. In, uh, and at the same time, I will be doing a fireside chat with one of our ATEC Advisory Council members. Uh, at the end of that, we will have the results tabulation and a live announcement of who our final eight would be. Uh, before we begin, I would like to take a moment to thank our sponsors, uh, CyReport, our event partner, uh, Morrison and & Forster, and uh, Baker & McKenzie. So let's begin by just introducing our 13 semifinalists. If we could put them up on the, uh, the screen. So the ATEC, the ATEC semifinals uh, start for the ATEC startup competition semifinals drew over 100 startups nominated by 35 participating university alumni clubs. Of these 100 startups, 25 were passed through the initial screening process and subsequently pitched live to our ATEC judges panel, comprising some of the most experienced VC investors in Asia. Yeah. Yeah. 13 semifinalists were then selected based on the judges' evaluations, representing some of the most innovative and exciting growth and technology opportunities in Asia. And I know it's kind of hard to see on the screen, but hopefully a lot of you will have an, had an opportunity to access their live pitches and judges Q&A that was available on the ATEC website. Uh, but the 13 semifinalists are Avant by the uh, Chicago Booth Alumni, Alumni Club. Avant is pioneer, pioneering animal protein technologies. We have Deep01 from the HBS Association of Taipei, who are doing powerful AI healthcare solutions to save lives. We have Eva, which is sponsored by the Hong Kong Alumni Club of the London Business School, which is doing ground to sky technology via drone infrastructure. We have Fano Labs, sponsored by the uh, MIT Sloan alumni community, which is doing voice AI for financial regulatory compliance. We have Genie Biome, which is sponsored by the Chinese University of Hong Kong Center, which is breaking the wall of colon cancer to save lives. We also had GigaCover, which is sponsored by the MIT Club of Singapore, which is providing financial benefits for the gig economy in Southeast Asia. The latter half, we have Hong Kong Deco Man, which is sponsored by Cyberport, uh, O2O One Stop Renovation Ecosystem. We also had Lifespans, which was sponsored by the MIT Club of Hong Kong, making technologies that make bone fracture repair safer for elderly patients. We also had Octify, which is making affordable credit to those who need it most. One Degree, building the operating system for the insurance industry. Pickup, the tech platform to help e-commerce deliver with flexibility and transparency. Cupital, the leading lending platform for Asia's e-commerce merchants. And Zero, creating a holistic plant-based food and beverage ecosystem in China. So with that, I would also take, like to take the opportunity to now introduce our judges panel. We could throw up the screen. Uh, it's very difficult to see, but you'll actually see their live in-person faces here, uh, in any case. Uh, to my left, we have Damien Nor Horth from UBS. We have Henry Tan from Q Ventures. Uh, 
Uh, we have Howard Chang from Cyberport. We have Robert Wright from Baker and McKinsey. We have uh, Chris Fisher from the GPO Fund, Anthony Wu from Alpha Intelligence Capital, Thomas Cho from Morrison Forster, and finally we have Judith Lee from Lily Asia Ventures. So with that, maybe we'll actually just dive straight into the discussion of the, uh, the startups themselves. And I think um, one of the comments that I think we had overall, just an overall comment, was that this year's uh, selection of startups from sort of start to finish, uh, most everyone was presently surprised by the consistent level of quality, uh, the commitment, the well-roundedness of the teams that were involved. And what was interesting just about the selection itself was the diversity of the different types of sectors that were represented. So one of the ones that was uh, caught our eye initially was also the presence of a lot of biotech and health tech companies. And so specifically, I'm talking about companies like Deep01, which uh, their innovation was focusing on using uh, detecting intracranial hemorrhages using AI based out of Taipei. We had Genie Biome based here in Hong Kong, which does non-invasive colorectal screening using predictive machine learning algorithms. And then we also had Lifespans, which was an orthopedic medical device company designed for use with uh, elderly patients. So given these companies, um, you know, I'd like to just ask the panel, you know, I think not all of you attended every, every uh, pitch per se, but I think all of you have some level of experience perhaps looking at similar types of companies as well. You know, of these, of these markets, what do you think has the most interesting addressable market? Uh, you know, when you, look, when you think about sort of uh, companies like this in this particular space, and maybe um, if we maybe we start maybe with, uh, with Judith, who I know who specializes in this, when you think about, uh, you know, investing in sort of the healthcare, health tech space, what sort of markets are interesting to you and what sort of criteria do you kind of look at and how do these companies compare with that? Uh, yeah, well, both Deep01 and Genie Bio, I think, had um, a very interesting intersection of both healthcare and AI. It's a very hot topic these days because healthcare, as exciting as it is, and uh, maybe I just make a plug for our industry, you'll notice that the COVID vaccine was actually developed in record time. So clearly, science has really caught up. Uh, but how can we make it even better, even cheaper? I think that's the next question. And um, I felt, you know, first of all, I echo your comments that all the startups are really, really high quality that we saw. Uh, but these two in particular, they really caught that intersection of using technology to actually make healthcare faster, cheaper, easier. Uh, so that, that was a really exciting trend. And in fact, um, it very much mirrors what VCs in healthcare look for these days. And which sort of set of IP uh, did you think was kind of the most innovative or unique between the companies? You know, we had, you know, Deep01 using sort of AI to do intracranial hemorrhages. Um, you know, they were training it on their kind of proprietary data set. We had sort of a medical device company, and then we had sort of Genie Biome, which kind of spoke focused more on the on sort of the microbiome side. Like, what what sort of IP do you? would you be interested in? And this is open up to the entire panel as well. Like, how do you think generally about, you know, the types of IP that you would be interested in? And how defensible do you think that is here in Asia? Well, uh, definitely not an IP expert. I, I know there are some other panelists that are. Uh, but, you know, of the three, um, it, actually for both uh, biomedical and uh, health tech side, so making medical devices or drugs, IP is uh, pretty core to every business. And actually, I think the reason all three of them made it to this stage is that they, they, they do have defensible IP. Uh, for the first two, it's a little bit more on the algorithm. So uh, as everyone knows, I think the AI is garbage in, garbage out. And um, if it's uh, good stuff in, then good stuff out. And uh, what they've done is they, they started trying to amass a, a very large data set. And, uh, and it feeds into the system and, and makes the prediction algorithm actually that much better. Um, so that's about half probably patentable algorithm and then half just trade secret. Uh, it, it really is whoever can amass the most data that wins. And, uh, and lifespans is, is very simple. I mean, it, it's a device and um, they probably have a composition of matter patent and some kind of use patent, uh, but it, it's a little bit more traditional. Uh, but all three, I think, are very defensible. But uh, I'm speaking out of turn since there are, I think, lawyers here <laughs> that might have more insight on the IP. Yeah, it's very true. I'd like to direct it to our, you know, two legal experts, you know, maybe if you could provide an opinion on, 
on what you see in terms of sort of uh, patent protection for, for companies that are being based here in Asia, specifically on, on the technical side, and then how that compares to you know, other jurisdictions around the world, maybe and how that influences maybe whether they decide to kind of launch a startup you know, in different geographies in Asia, if there's any kind of difference there to be thought about. Um, hi, this is Thomas. Um, you know, on that theme, you know, one thing that I've seen a lot in my practice, I'm a lawyer representing a lot of startups and venture capital investors, is that in the life science space and, and the AI-enabled life science space, we are seeing a lot of entrepreneurs who maybe maybe they're Chinese, but they've been trained and they've worked in the U.S. for a long time. And I think thanks in part to you know, some of the initiatives that Hong Kong has implemented to try to attract more biotech companies. I'm getting a lot more of these calls for these uh, from these entrepreneurs that want to, pick, they, may, they may have just started their business in the U.S. based on, um, you know, their prior career, but they're looking to relocate into, you know, to China, uh, Hong Kong, you know, Shanghai, Hong Kong, other cities. And so I think that the kind of the level of um, experienced entrepreneurs we're, we're getting in the market as as reflected by the kind of companies that we're seeing today at you know at, in the competition is is very high and the type of um, strategies that they look at in terms of developing their IP portfolio and defending it are are pretty commensurate with what we're seeing in terms of global best practices so that's that's very encouraging and is there a level of uh, regulatory arbitrage when you think about these uh, you know these specifically you know, these healthcare companies, even I'm thinking a little bit about like lifespans, for example, as a medical device company, you know, they're based here in Hong Kong. Um, but when we, when they did their pitch and we, there were questions that came up during the judges Q and A around sort of their roadmap going forward. And it seemed that they were launching, uh, in the U S first. And a lot of that was influenced by their ability to can, kind of gain initial approval. And there was this discussion like, why not Europe? Why not China? And definitely seemed that the, the roadmap looked like U.S. followed by other develop, developed countries, finally by to Asia. Is that, uh, is that a common theme, you think, across, you know, not just medical device companies, but any of these uh, various startups in the healthcare space or medtech space that require like some level of approval? And if so, does that sort of put companies, does that influence how they think about whether or not to launch these sort of companies here in Asia itself? Yeah, sure. I, I can chime in on that one. Um, so, you know, we, we just talked about IP and IP really is global these days. You, you file in every jurisdiction and then, then you have to go through each separate regulatory process. And uh, the question that we had actually asked lifespans is why they didn't go through the European C mark, which traditionally was the easier way. And their response, which I thought was a very interesting one, is in the last couple of years, it's actually easier to go through US FDA process. Uh, that surprised me personally, but I think devil's in the details of each type of medical device. And uh, the path that they're pursuing, which I think is the 510K, actually probably is easier in the US FDA these days. Uh, so there's a, a little bit of a difference in how quickly you can get through each jurisdiction's uh, process. And unsurprisingly, uh, once you pass one jurisdiction's process, it's that much easier to kind of just apply. Uh, and the, the next jurisdiction will look to the data that you already submitted, and it's all public domain anyway. So that's one strategy that companies will take. Uh, I think China, uh, Asia, well, Asia in general plays a really interesting role here too. Uh, it's not often the first market that people try to get, but it is um, now oftentimes the largest market for many products. And uh, again, lifespans is a great example, is aging population. And, uh, and Asia notoriously has an increasingly aging population that needs these products. So um, it's not only that the regulatory pathway is a certain, I think, level of, of easy, but also recruiting patients and how quickly you can run your clinical trials that plays a factor for some companies. Um, so long story short, it's doubles in the details, but I, I thought all three companies were very thoughtful in, in how they navigated this. And quite a few of these companies, uh, and this is not just limited healthcare, um, are implementing you know, AI and machine learning as part of their core uh, technology set. And you know, take for example, Deep Depot One, uh, it focuses on intracranial hemorrhages. Um, to what extent does, I guess, uh, patient privacy, the availability of you know, uh, medical data to inform their models, um, to what extent is that important? 
How is that different in Asia? And I'm also thinking specifically, like for example, in China, which actually has made large inroads as you know, effectively kind of a leader in in this particular space. You know, how much of that is related to just differences of approaches in terms of the availability of like the underlying patient patient data? Uh, sure, may maybe I can um, just have some observations. And I, again, there's probably legal experts that are better at the, the privacy part. Uh, just in terms of commercial landscape in, in general. I think folks are a little more easygoing about patient data, especially used in the aggregate here in Asia. Uh, it's probably a leapfrog effect. So by the time uh, China especially caught up, uh, people are just very used to aggregate data being used to inform certain decisions. And in fact, they trust that the data is being used to, uh, to the good, not, not to their detriment. Uh, and of course, I think in every jurisdiction, it is not legal to pinpoint a certain patient after you collect their data, that, that's a, a given. But um, it's a little more gray area uh, looking at the, the data in aggregate and kind of informing decisions that way. Uh, and again, but the two companies, two out of three are using uh, these algorithms. And uh, we didn't see any evidence on, on the judging panel of pinpointing specific patients, which would be an issue. Uh, what they're trying to do is just use the data to better their algorithm, which is perfectly fine. Yeah, just just to add quickly on that, I think um, in terms of patient identification, usually for most of these com communication systems, um, inference or the process of inference is done at the edge, meaning that um, computers or 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 laptops that are used by radiologists are actually running algorithms by themselves. So and and it's usually not not cloud based. At least if they request, if there's such a request, I don't think. Um, uh, you know, a cloud solution is uh, is necessary. So I think that that solves that. In in terms of common division for let's say radiologists, I think that's that's actually getting commoditized. So and I think it's uh, it's a general trend. It's good for us because it's uh, it's it's easy to run. You and I can run uh, this thing called so called TensorFlow, which which is very easy to uh, to use, and then we can all have different sort of al algorithms applied to different uh, use cases. Um, for deep one, I think they do have a, an, an edge in terms of deploying in Asia, and there's this trend in uh, in what in computer vision or, or AI enabled radio radiology uh, pointing towards this this thing called care coordination. It essentially coordinate it's it's, it's uh, essentially a coordination of different components or different stakeholders within the healthcare ecosystem. So imagine when you as a patient go into the hospital. Um, all the doctors or all the uh, appropriate stakeholders, um, nurses, they would already have your information and you would already know what treatment pathway to go through even before you step into the hospital. That's the, the next step in terms of automating the whole process of healthcare and making that more efficient. Actually, I would like to amplify one of the points also that you just made. Because um, I see quite a few of these uh, radiology related kind of neural network uh, approaches. Um, and my concern really about this is also the proprietary nature of this. You know, in the very beginning, this is uh, very powerful diagnostically. Uh, but once it's kind of solved, um, the, the analogy I think of is like the Apple Newton uh, when handwriting recognition was very new. Uh, so having a, a big data set on handwriting samples was very useful, uh, but now um, how you actually uh, make that profitable over the longer term, um, now that uh, handwriting recognition is ubiquitous, um, voice recognition is ubiquitous, you know, will they be able to sustain an advantage and continue to uh, monetize that in some way going forward? Uh, one, one element of personal information and privacy that uh, affects our practice a lot is when we have um, Asian investors or non-US investors investing in US companies that do um, involve the processing of a lot of personal data, you know, that can create um, some national security concerns. So CFIUS is very focused on that kind of dissemination of personal information. That makes it uh, a bit more difficult for Asia-based investors to 
to, to make those investments. Sometimes they can be done depending on how you structure it. But I think that's an advantage for some of these Asia-based companies that are also using the data for these local markets. Of course, there are still you know, data localization and other types of um, important regulatory issues in China, for example. But you know, if you can invest in a company uh, as an Asian investor into a jurisdiction here where they're not going to have national security concerns about the nature of um, the investor's background, I think that's going to give these companies out here a little bit more opportunities to raise capital from, from the investors in Asia that would otherwise look at in the U.S. Very interesting. And maybe just to round off you know, this discussion on, on, on the, these companies, on health tech, um, maybe throw it open. A more broader question, but perhaps for sort of VC investors, right? How can VC investors add value to these I, very, you know, IP heavy early stage companies. What, what do you typically see? And then maybe if, if you can speak specifically about, you know, companies in, in Asia, if you have any kind of perspectives, like where you sort of feel that, uh, you know, VC investors typically can, can help the most in terms of either de-risking it or, you know, you know, expanding, you know, the existing proposition that, that they have. Um. I would say that the, uh, well, so there are a lot of systems, there are a lot of legacy systems within healthcare that, that, that VCs can actually work with. Um, VCs are, are by nature very holistic, meaning that you are, you, are, you are looking at the whole industry from a consulting angle. Right? So I think, I think um, we, are, we are quite, you know, so, so got privileged in, in the sense that we, are, we can engage with different stakeholders at the same time. Um, meaning that in the future, for any automation um, uh, solution providers to come in, it's easier to go through, let, let's say, a VC network to deploy across different stakeholders. I think right now, a lot of the, um, in terms of information, talent, resources, a lot of those are still siloed, especially in the healthcare space. And so it's, uh, it's, it's uh, what I think VCs can add value from that perspective, meaning that you can still, from an investor angle, you can coordinate and, and make sure that resources are, or they can be allocated efficiently, so. I can, I can add to that. From my side, I look at to a lot of the deep tech, often with a hardware element to it, which also have a lot of IP behind it. One of the biggest challenge we see for them is the time it takes for them to commercialize, right? Oftentimes these companies are B2B focused. So I think us as a, as the, from a VC perspective, as Anthony said, we look at a lot of industry, we talk to a lot of corporate members, right? So that's actually one way we could help them is to identify specific technology that map against a specific corporate that might actually have the needs and we could be the enabler to, to do the matchmaking. So hopefully that will shorten the time for them to commercialize the IP into an actual product. Great. So uh, let's move on now to, uh, I guess, the segment I'm calling the future of food. So we, it's interesting that we had, we had obviously several companies uh, out of the 100 and then out of the 25 that were looking at, I guess, a, a kind of a bit of a sea change in terms of consumer preferences, right? Uh, in terms of how people view food. Uh, whether it is all the various diets out there or whether it's driven from environmental or climate change concerns, you know, people are uh, re, you know, readdressing kind of how they think about what they put inside their bodies. So, you know, we had two companies. We had Avant, which was a uh, cultured meat, specifically fish protein uh, company um, that was essentially, you know, structuring as a, an alternative to plant-based meats, right? Alternative, alternative uh, to obviously real fish, but also as an alternative to actual the plant-based uh, meat movement. And then we had a Zero, which is by the Yokai Group, uh, based in China, which was a you know a plant-based meat company specifically um, targeting the Chinese market. And I thought what was interesting. Uh, well, I guess the first question is, how do you uh, as investors think about these? you know, particular markets, like when you think about cultured meat, cultured proteins versus kind of plant-based, is that, is that a trade-off in your mind? Is, are they complementary to each other? Like, how do you think about the relative, you know, opportunity set when kind of evaluating uh, what the future looks like? Um, 
Right, that's a great question. Um, I would say that so 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 plant based proteins are are what they are they operate based on the uh, this this mechanic called um, what biomimicry. You are you are creating something that 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 looks like or feels like meat or tastes like meat, when they are actually not meat itself, right? Um, in terms of uh, you know protein or meat uh, cell cultivation, that's that's actually creating real meat. So in a sense, I would say that the plant-based solution is almost like an intermediate, you know, transitional phase compared to the end goal, which is like creating real meat. Um, but then the problem right now is because I think it takes a lot of effort, it takes a lot of uh, time to optimize or, or refine the process of actual protein cultivation. Uh, I think that's mainly because for traditional meat processing that's already what um, the value chain is very, it runs, it, 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 it got streamlined over, over time, it runs very smoothly. For, for new kinds of approaches to protein cultivation, those are still getting refined over time. So th th those are, there are still a lot of inefficiencies across the whole process. And I think um, I've heard statistics saying that, uh, you know, new ways of uh, protein cult cultivation can take seven to 10 years to mature. So I would so I would venture to say that plant based solution is a, is an intermediate step, and then hopefully we can achieve the uh, the whole the holy grail within like the next five seven years. Uh, I actually I actually see that I, I agree with that uh, I agree with the time frame. Uh, I actually see them coexisting on into the future as with other highly processed foods. So we have tang, we have peanut butter, we have, you know, if you look at what we eat uh, on, a, on a daily basis, um, there still are these highly processed foods. So I, I agree that's an intermediate and that the long-term um, beneficial for society type of uh, approach is, is for cultivating these uh, actual meats. Um, but in the meantime, we will have some of these uh, plant-based protein substitutes that people may actually take into very creative directions uh, and become products that exist forever, like a spam or something like that. And it seems a lot of, like a lot of the you know plant-based meat companies have you know spent a lot of efforts on marketing and branding and cultivating the consumers as as, as you were suggesting. Um, my I'm, I'm not a VC, but my understanding is that. The pool of VCs that are willing to do the cell-based, you know, proteins is smaller because of those perceived um, the perceived timeline to really develop a, a scalable and cost-effective product. So I, I think those kind of true believer investors who are really committed to that, they are investing in some of these companies like Memphis Meats in the U.S. But and and it's great to see that in Asia you have that type of uh, offering as well. But I, I think that, you know, um, as my panelists said, it, it, the plant-based portion is is an intermediary step. And maybe those same companies with all the branding and expertise can, can you know, broaden their product, um, you know, portfolio later on to include the cell-based proteins. Yeah, it seems like a, quite an interesting challenge. Uh, and I like the way that you're framing it. And I guess the, the, the question is, if plant-based is an intermediary step, because it feels like uh, plant-based versus cultured proteins um, requires maybe the larger change in consumer behavior. And the question is whether or not, for example, like Anthony, you mentioned sort of a five to seven year time frame, seven to 10 year time frame, is that sufficient enough for consumer behavior kind of to change, to shift in that time? Or will cultured proteins, for example, replicate kind of the mouthfeel of, of meats? You know, it seems like an easier substitute, at least from the consumer perspective. Um, now, just talking about on the technology side, I thought what was interesting about the way that, say, Avant had positioned themselves was that they placed themselves on the continuum between plant-based meats and what, they, what, what they've what termed as medical pharma, right? So from a technolo technology standpoint, they're further along the lines towards medical pharma on a number of different degrees. So, you know, what they do has sort of higher technology barriers than plant-based meats, very low tech, tech barriers for plant-based meats, you know, medium to high time to market versus low time to market for plant-based meats and higher margins. Um, how much does this influence how you guys all think as investors into these, you know, particular businesses? I mean, you've, you mentioned the thing about timeframes, but also like, you know, specifically around the, the IP itself and, you know, what comes innate to that? Like, how does that influence the relative attractiveness that you think about these opportunities? Uh, 
I think, um, yeah, that's, that's not a great question. I think, um, yeah, similar because of the fact that it takes time for uh, cell cultivation, the cell cultivation process to mature. Um, uh, assuming that that is the primary re revenue stream, ideally we, we, we want to see like a secondary revenue stream that can come before that, right? And, and I think I found it sort of doing that because I think I found has this, uh, it's this uh, C collagen thing, which, which allows them to, to monetize uh, prior to them uh, getting the, uh, the the cell cultivation thing uh, much good, right? So, 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 and I think that is a you know from an investor perspective that makes the whole value proposition much more uh, appealing compared to just let's say aiming for. It's almost like quantum computing, right? So, so if if you tell me that oh I'm I'm creating a quantum co computer from scratch now. Uh, that would take a lot of time. While if you say like, oh, we have this solution called, I think I think it's called NISC, uh, uh, noisy intermediate quantum something. It's it's that it's that intermediate step that takes you through the whole process until real quantum uh, uh, materialize. So I think it's it's very similar. You want something that is more more palatable in the short term. I think another point that Avon has done well uh, is that they actually stay in the university system for quite a while. They actually got a lot of university support. They all got a lot of grant because I think for a lot of a deep IP company, the, the initial phase is, is, is just indeed very long. So as much as you could get non-dilutive financing, that's actually uh, ensure a higher chance of success. I just wanted to chime in uh, since healthcare investors, I think, have to wait the longest. It sometimes wait, you know, five, 10 years before a drug is approved and makes any cent of revenue. And the way it works for us is um, actually the entire financial chain changes. So, for example, companies can actually not even go into a single human being and go public. And, uh, and investors can actually exit when a company is preclinical, believe it or not. Um, so it, it, it's almost that um, because people recognize these are groundbreaking technologies, but they take a long time and, and they're heavily regulated. Uh, so the, somehow the, uh, each stage, um, all the, the financiers also accept that. And um, I think one day, I, we're not as familiar with uh, this plant-based food technology movement, but it, it feels very revolutionary. And it's actually possible that uh, eventually you'll get people investing based on the speculation that 10, uh, 20 years from now, it could, it could change the world. So uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting how um, the, the financial system also adapts to support these companies. That's a good point. Um, let's talk specifically about the their business models, right? I think this is an interesting contrast. I think you know we've alluded to kind of time to market. We've talked about a little bit of their technology. Um, for zero itself, what was interesting about this business is I think this is um, a little bit of a consensus between the judges too that from a technology standpoint, similar to most plant based companies, it's not a high barrier, right? But what was interesting in the short space of time that they had with, I think, sort of 18 months, they had generated like significant business traction, uh, especially in a, a market like China, right? How much do you uh, value that as an investor? How much do you weigh like the initial traction that they generated? And maybe if you could think about specifically about Zero itself, the way that they, they've done it, which seems like very much kind of like a, a grassroots campaign um, around almost kind of like doing sort of a, a crowdsourcing of like product development. You know, they're trying to see which products kind of fit best and, and basically, you know, market that through, you know, very canny social media. Uh, how much of that is important as an investor? And then in the context of China, uh, how unique do you think that that is as a competitive advantage? Well, th these are uh, two very different styles of investing. There's one approach where you look for something that can get out there in the market, generate a lot of traction, um, establish a dominant position, generate a bunch of margins and exit, or, you know, kind of that company then gets maybe subsumed into some larger corporation or kind of consolidates some area of consumer interest. The other is to address a really big market, um, doing something really groundbreaking, uh, take a little longer term perspective. Um, so you look for slightly different characteristics in both cases. Uh, what I saw was zero. I was very impressed with the way they used chefs in the process to, you know, really get very close to consumers and um, and, and people that are experts uh, that know the consumer uh, desires and tastes and fads and trends and be able to actually 
kind of develop products around uh, those tastes. So for that first style of investing where you're looking for the kind of quick win, um, you know, I think they're firmly in that category and they've shown some very strong signs of being very adaptive and flexible and market oriented. Uh, those are all positive signals for me in that style of investing. Uh, in the deep tech space, I like what Avant was doing. They're focused on cost and long-term cost trends, um, really trying to solve a big problem, trying to be very competitive uh, in the longer term, but not really spending a lot of time in marketing. Doing some interesting stuff to keep, to, you know, to basically generate cash flow, extend their runway. Uh, this is very positive. Doesn't take a huge amount of marketing sense. I think it's going to be a B two B sale. They're going to be selling the cosmetics companies. Um, so, so that's that's good as well. But this, this is two different, very different. It's two different funds, really. Different mandate, different uh, style. Yeah, I think that much is clear. I think it's it's just interesting to compare the two, just because you know this is two different ends of the the spectrum in terms of you know trying to solve effectively kind of the same problem, right? Um, but I think you guys have teased out, you know, the differences in time scale, time frame, the differences in technology. Um, maybe let's talk a little bit about the relevance of competition, right, for these different business models. So, you know, you have a company that has, um, you know, strong IP, uh, but a much longer time scale, time frame. And then you have another, which is much lower technology barriers, higher business traction, obviously, maybe even easier time to market, time to gain funding because it's just an easier, um, you know, uh, easier proposition to understand for a wider set of investors. Uh, when you think about competition for businesses like this, what kind of stands out to you? Like, for example, Zero wants to become kind of like a large moving FM, FMCG company in China, equivalent to kind of the Unilevers of the world, right? That's a very ambitious goal. Um, in a place like China, how, how likely is that? How, how difficult is that? Versus, you know, a company like Avan Meats trying to change kind of the way that people think about cultured proteins, is, how relevant is competition for that particular space? Is it, you know, more driven by, you know, changes in IP? If someone comes up with like a, you know, a more effective way to cultivate that protein, does that mean that their business model is then impaired? <laughs> I just want to chime in with a quick comment because um, you asked a really, really difficult question. And uh, I think that's why all that's of us are kind of <laughs> sh shaking our head and <laughs> not wanting to answer. Uh, and that actually is the crux of VC is how you predict that. Um, to, at least in our firm, uh, it's all about team. So the, the team has to match whatever they claim they can do. And what you just described is two basically opposite teams. There's a very scientific team that can continuously offer breakthroughs. And their barrier is their IP and their core technology. And the other is an execution-based team. Uh, has to be on the ground, rolling up their sleeves. Uh, and oftentimes we see such a mismatch of what a team wants to do and, and what they uh, are good at doing. So that, that's one red flag. But also uh, it, you know, to the earlier point about different styles of investing, there are some investors that are very deep pocketed and, and they want to invest in the, the giant things. And then uh, sometimes they, they are okay with uh, the company burning billions of dollars before getting there. Uh, and then other investors want to see the operational metrics and the, the evidence of this execution. So uh, it is it's really hard. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that, but essentially the team has to match. I'll, um, just, just to pick up on that, I, I, I also thought it was a fascinating question. But the, I, one of the things I learned, I've, I've been a research analyst my whole career. One of the things I learned very early in my career is that capital is not a barrier to entry. Hey, um, if you've got a good idea, if you've got a good idea, then you, know, you will find capital. If you've got a good team, if you've got a good idea, and you can you know, build the narrative for, for you know, VCs or ultimately some other type of exit, you, know, you'll, you should be able to find a way. So you know, if, as, as you was saying, right, you've got you know, the, the intersection of a great idea and a great team, is is the sweet spot in my mind, and that doesn't matter whether you're a startup or a uh, um, a company looking to IPO. Fantastic. So I think we're going to wrap up this portion and then move on to what I call kind of fintech. And I'd like to say thank you to Judith, who I know who has to kind of step out, but thank you very much for your time and expertise. Uh, thank you. So uh, let's move on and talk about uh, fintech. So fintech uh, being based here in Hong Kong. 
being based in the Greater Bay Area, um, it's no surprise that we had lots of fintech startups uh, and participants applying. So the ones that we kind of had here were Octify, uh, Octify, which is enabling access to credit in Southeast Asia, We're essentially doing buy now, pay later schemes. Uh, we had Cupidal, which is like a, a leading lending platform for Asia's e-commerce merchants. We had One Degree, which is uh, a company based here in Hong Kong that has one of the four virtual insurance licenses, uh, kind of doing a SaaS insur insurance model, targeting uh, kind of the GBA in the future. And then we had GigaCover, which is designed to provide financial benefits for uh, the gig economy in Southeast Asia. So, you know, I guess the, the first, what I thought about when looking at these companies is, is uh, just top down, looking at the markets that they kind of address. You know, it's clear that uh, two of them, you know, GigaCover and, uh, sorry, GigaCover and Octify were specifically focused on Southeast Asia, right? And the, uh, for Southeast Asia, large parts of their, you know, thesis, their investment thesis was around uh, their underbanked, underprotected, underserved markets, very nascent uh, consumers of uh, financial products versus, I guess, you know, Cupidol and One Degree, which are further along the lines of sophistication, looking more at sort of like the China GBA markets as their core markets. How do you guys think about, you know, the relative attractiveness of, you know, these particular end markets for uh, fintech products or financial products? Uh, I think just to start with, I think if we if we segment the market a little bit, like uh, I think some, you know, Octify and, and uh, GigaCover were, def were definitively consumer businesses, right? And... Um, Whereas you know you have something like One Degree, which was which which was much more of a, a B two B infrastructure play. Right? Um, different, you know, I suppose different longer term opportunities, um, and you know, very different sales cycles, and ultimately very different margin profiles as well. Uh, if um, yeah, if I think about something like Southeast Asian consumer finance, right? That's that's going to interest everyone in financial services. <laughs> that is, um, you know, it, it's almost the sort of the you know the last great um, market opportunity for um, uh, for sort of the underbanked uh, the you know the underbanked market. So uh, yeah, huge opportunity. Um, you're seeing the middle class grow. You're seeing the regulatory framework um, evolve. Uh, and you know, you, you know, both of those companies, I thought, well, all of those companies thought, had had interesting propositions. Um, but a little bit going back to the discussion on healthcare about the sort of, you know, Judith was talking about the intersection of AI and um, uh, and and healthcare. I, I think a lot about the intersection of technological change in financial services and regulatory change. Right? And and this is where I think. Um, the legacy players tend to be weak you know, uh, uh, on technology. Uh, I'd include UBS in that. I'm sorry if there's anyone from UBS technology listening. Um, but the legacy players tend to be weaker on technology but tend to understand the regulatory framework a little more uh, in a more nuanced fashion. So I think where, um, where, the, where the startups are going uh, to be challenged, and this comes back to can the team, you know, can the team manage this? I thought one degree impressed me on, you know, their team understood that the regulatory challenges were going to be uh, material and they would, you know, they would have to address these over time. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, I think the, the exciting thing is you've got the tech, you know, you've got the technology evolution, but can you manage the regulatory evolution as well? Maybe we can hear a little bit from our, Two lawyers on the on the panel. Happy to talk about the regulatory <laughs> angle because I think, particularly in Southeast Asia, that's a that's a really developing area. You know, in markets like Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, where I think a lot of our um, you know startups that we're looking at are, are, are quite active and they are looking to sort of expand outside of Singapore, for example, which has been a home ground for for a couple of them. We, we saw. Um, I think the the big shift in the last few years that I think a few other people have touched on already is is the access to data 
and, and access to data in these Southeast Asian markets, you know, has been, I think, the big shift in the last few years that it, it's, it's still developing. And, and that's, I think, where people see the, the real opportunity. And, and, and the other interesting feature, I think, of those Southeast Asian markets is, is the new regulation. And, and we're seeing sort of similar things here in Hong Kong with, you know, um, the opportunities that have been presented through virtual insurance licenses, which is a, a new area, a new developing opportunity for, uh, for players uh, to, to take advantage of uh, new regulations, which are purposefully uh, flexible to allow, I think, opportunities to grow uh, that we, we, we don't necessarily see in, as you say, the, the sort of more mature markets, which are a little slower often to move. So I think that's, that's a real opportunity for some of the, 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 the players we're looking at in, in this uh, our tech uh, conference. Yeah, actually, I think that's a good segue into the technology portion of this, because I think uh, when you look across, you know, all four of these companies and many other participants, again, part of their core technology was, as you said, access to data, uh, educating their machine learning algorithms over, a, you know, a large set of non-traditional, you know, data sets. Some of them had proprietary data sets. Um, I guess one of the questions I had is, how important is proprietary, proprietary data sets versus, for example, the correct selection of variables from a wide range of data sets, including you know, public, uh, public data sets. Because I think uh, when we you know, talked to some of these companies, they said you know, the way that they choose and select which variables to focus on and train their models is actually their true IP. This is the thing that, you know, that is specific to them. So just this question, uh, because I think this and many other startups in this space you know, are very focused on this and the efficacy of their particular models will actually determine in many cases, especially in financial services, the, the quality of their businesses, whether it's kind of loss ratios, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So happy to uh, receive any opinions on this. Right. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's another great question. Um, for data itself, so I think you are alluding to, to the, uh, the trade-off between uh, uh, the abundance of, of alternative data Versus this process called feature engineering, meaning that you are finding out what what salient features there are to, to focus on. Um, both are important. I think at this stage, though, uh, the whole the whole process, the whole process of inference is uh, is such a blue ocean thing. It's such is so new and so um, still uh, what yet to be discovered that there's a lot of low hanging fruits. So we are seeing we are actually seeing um, uh, what a trend towards applying so-called not as advanced or even you know stupid <laughs> algos to crack the whole game um, and and I can give you an, an example where where people can just use decision trees or a bunch of decision trees which can create a so-called random forest that thing can 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 still be very potent and very powerful in terms of cracking the whole the whole um, um, what um, the problem of let's say screening out which loan applicants are reliable versus those that are not. Um, I don't think in terms of literature or, or, or in terms of actual academic research, there's there's a lot of um, what um, th th there are just too much variables, too many variables to focus on. So we don't exactly know what kind of data is um, is conducive to what kind of consumer psychology and what kind of consumer psychology is conducive to what kind of behavior. So the whole chain of, of reaction is still undiscovered. And that's why we're seeing a lot of, um, we're actually seeing a lot of startups focusing on different segments within the value chain. So some would focus on, you know, how you use a mobile app can, can, be, um, can be illustrative of what your psychology is, what the psyche is. And what the uh, psychology is can reflect or can be, can be used as a inference engine towards what your behavior can be. So those are two separate things. Um, and so I think at this stage, uh, almost all the, uh, the stops that we're, that, we're, that we're looking at, they all use some sort of machine learning. And I, and I think those are sufficient, more, more than sufficient, because I think it's, uh, it's still a long way towards how we actually understand uh, what our interaction with, with mobile devices and mapping that towards a, um, a what, a re, let's say a repayment rate for different loans. It's a long, complicated, and tedious process. So. Maybe this is or maybe last question on the, on the fintech side before we move on. Um, one of the issues that was brought up, you know, during the judges' Q and A, 
for a lot of these companies is their sustainability of their pricing power. You know, a lot of these companies are, are startups. A lot of them are moving into segments that are non-traditional, that are underserved by traditional financial institutions. And then in some respects, they, you know, they have a kind of a little bit of a first mover advantage. They have lack of competition and that translated into, you know, relatively high pricing and margins. And I think there was a lot of questions about what the sustainability of that looks like sort of going forward. Well, what are your opinions on this? And maybe even relative to what Anthony was saying about, you know, we don't know yet, like how people's consumer behavior changes in like a mobile setting. Does that translate into kind of higher sustainable pricing power? So uh, uh, to talk, go back to what Anthony was saying, I, I think one of the most important things for, again, for any business is, okay, knowing what your competitive advantage is, like where, where in the value chain and where in the competitive landscape do you genuinely stand out? Right? And that can be technology, that can be uh, consumer um, you know, sort of brand awareness, but it, it, it can also be you know, focus on a specific geographic area like Southeast Asia. So um, you know, the, the first thing is, okay, what is your competitive advantage? Um, and then that, which, which brings you back to that, that exact point, right? As markets evolve, as markets change, um, you know, legacy players do ultimately change as well. And, and things like this, the buy now, pay, pay later segment, it's, it's fascinating how quickly it's grown in developed markets, um, in, in Scandinavia, in Australia, in, um, in North America. So you've got Afterpay, you've got Klarna, um, and that's attracted um, you know, PayPal, et cetera. So you know, you've, you've seen this, this massive growth in this new segment um, but as you say, it will, you know, the growth will attract competition uh, and will almost always lead to uh, uh, margin compression. Unless they get acquired, these small companies get acquired by the dominant one. So yeah. that's, a different, that's a different return profile, but that could be how some of these regional companies end up being finding their, finding their exit. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that could well be part of the strategy, right? To survive until it's time that you make an attractive uh, acquisition target. So just moving on quickly, because we're running short of time, we still have four last uh, companies to talk about. I guess the segment maybe is more like Hong Kong champions, right? We have a, a company called Hong Kong Decoman, uh, you know, sponsored by Cyberport, uh, that focuses, uh, builds itself essentially as a one-stop shop for renovation uh, in Hong Kong. High traction, um, has been around for a while. It does a smart matching service for renovation services between contractors, suppliers, and consumers. And then we also have Pickup, uh, which has generated quite a lot of like, uh, you know, positive traction over the, you know, in recent times, which is essentially doing fast, reliable delivery using predictive analytics and smart routing and cost optimization. And what's interesting about them is probably they focus a lot on, uh, you know, gig workers as opposed to kind of like fleet management. And that's their differentiation. They believe that they have a much more flexible model relative to that. I guess, um, you know, these are obviously not, not comparable, um, but at least from a, from a Hong Kong perspective, how interesting is it that you have models that are being developed in Hong Kong and then their translatability into kind of like a, an expansion in kind of to, to broader Asia? What, let me, let me, we can start with like Hong Kong Decoman. I think Howard, you're probably quite familiar with uh, the company itself. You know, what do you think about this? Because it's quite a niche market, right? What, what do you think about their ability to kind of like translate beyond sort of the, uh, the Hong Kong, Hong Kong market? Yeah, I think I think um, company like uh, Dacoman definitely has a, has an uh, is working on a niche market in Hong Kong uh, because the um, the house renovation sector is quite fragmented and and they look into that and 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 have the intelligence in in that sector and they are basically I think using Hong Kong as a base um, uh, to to um, to review the market and see how the business model is working. And I, I, I believe there are very similar market uh, within the Southeast Asia or even in the, in the Greater Bay Area where they can definitely expand into. Uh, by testing out the Hong Kong market, they, I, I believe they do have a, a strong advantage of, of going into the, um, the Southern China uh, to further expand their, their businesses, which uh, are quite similar. Yeah. So yeah, the way I look at both of these companies is uh, they rely heavily on like one network effect, one network effect. You can count up to maybe sixteen or seventeen types of network effect. They rely on they rely on very local types of network. Uh, 
uh, similar to a telephone company that has actually wires back to the phone. So it's a last mile cut and play. He steps into those elements. He steps into those elements. Um, and from, from that perspective, um, when looking at a company like this to invest in, it really does come down to their ability to effectively execute that in a local market and then show me that they can move to two markets and they can go to four markets and go to 16. Um, so I would look for evidence of that in, in whether they're going to be successful. In it. From a thing, oh, go ahead, it seems that, you know, one interesting thing is that you're seeing a lot of alumni come out of these large unicorns like Uber. Um, and, and a lot of those alumni had been involved in launching in various different cities throughout Asia Pac. I think we've always said that one of the advantages of the Hong Kong entrepreneur is that they often have that kind of skill set based on their corporate experience. So it's good to see that, um, that, that this is a kind of um, thesis that is playing out for some of the Hong Kong based entrepreneurs. And I think we saw that with Pickup, didn't we? I mean, we saw that, that that model being replicated in other markets. So that they've now sort of, I think, turned profit in markets outside of Hong Kong. And that's, I think, that's that's you know evidence probably to get to your, to your point that you, you're able to replicate that uh, that model outside the market and then ideally, you know, continue from there. Let's talk a little bit about Pickup, actually. Like from a technology standpoint, how defensible do you think their their approach is? You know, like they they spoke a lot about you know, there are various models like trying to do local optimization approaches, right? Given kind of the traffic data and the consumer data they kind of received, like how, um, you know, from the outside in, it feels a little bit black box. How differentiated is that and how difficult to replicate is that by competition? Uh, so, yeah, so, uh, well, the way to evaluate that really is look at their unit economics and what they're able to establish. Um, how difficult is it to replicate depends on how good, how well they do it. <laughs> um, so when you combine technology with assets in an optimization problem, um, that can be a barrier. It definitely, it's what you, anybody can buy assets, uh, anybody can create a technology, but for somebody to tie those two things together is still quite a, quite an art uh, and you know the measure of that is unit economics yeah uh, I agree totally to that uh, I think company like Peckup, where they combine technology with also a certain percentage of their operation are still quite labor intensive uh, when they go from market to market it depends on how well they can execute that um, because they do rely a little bit on the on the on the local labor market and how those people deliver uh, according to you know to the to the service level and and things would, would would make determine whether they are successful in the local market or not. Very good. So I think uh, we're running short time. So let's talk about the last two companies here. Uh, again, not comparable to each other. We have Fano Labs, uh, which uh, specializes in you know uh, natural language processing, automatic speech recognition, and other ba big data technologies to help enterprises with uh, customer services, compliance, and other lines of business. And in particular, I think in our and their pitch to, to us, you know, they focus a lot about uh, financial compliance and solving, you know, that particular problem uh, to a higher degree of uh, accuracy than existing methods. And then we have uh, Eva, which is a very interesting company, which is an all-in-one drone infrastructure uh, play. Uh, their main products are kind of vertical stations, you know, stationary uh, stations from which drones to, to launch off from. Uh, they can, you know, basically house, charge, uh, and, and load. Uh, drones and also kind of the mobile version of, of, of that as well. So maybe let me start first with uh, with Fano Labs. Um, you know, it's interesting that uh, there are many kind of NLP related companies out there. A lot of them are, uh, you know, focused on the financial markets, but maybe doing a lot of sort of sentiment analysis. Um, was it interesting that, you know, Fano Labs has, you know, spent quite a bit of time just focusing on the compliance piece? How big a market is that and how attractive is that? So anyone that's worked in a large financial services organization over the course of the last 10 years knows that you know, the, the biggest growth area has been the compliance department. I, um, and that just goes back to the financial crisis and um, you know, the, the regulatory evolution we've been talking, we've, we were talking about earlier on. Uh, so it's, it is a big opportunity and, and NLP, the application of NLP is is it's very it makes very intuitive sense to me um, in the context of that challenge. So I do see it as a, a as a significantly attractive market and something which you know you could see 
large financial services organizations outsourcing to a degree. Um, in terms of NLP, there's actually a lot of de developments um, in the past year or so. There's this thing called uh, GPT-3 from OpenAI. That's super powerful. It, it contains tens of billions of, of, of hundreds of billions of parameters. So, so um, uh, it's still a volatile space, meaning that we still don't know what the what, what so-called holy grail is for, for NLP. Uh, but then still, that a lot of the uh, what a lot of the uh, current technology is actually sort of commoditized because Google and 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 different companies have been sort of open sourcing that 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 that, 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 that tech. So, in terms of uh, final apps um, focusing on compliance, I think that's a that's a great thing because I think I think internally they they conducted some some sort of you know McKinsey like strategic willingness to, to pay analysis and they sort of identified that as their you know their use case the pri the primary the most uh, appealing use case. Um, what I sort of want to see more is is uh, once you go into compliance, I'm fairly sure that there's a lot of um, both semantic understanding interpretation. And and following the process of compliance or, or regulatory, you know, protocols, and that involves something like a, I don't know, like a like a knowledge map. Uh, you, you need to teach the the computer to go through the whole process by itself, and that is complicated. It's not easy. So I think uh, they are on the right track, but I'm not sure if they have all the uh, components at hand to automate the whole um, the whole compliance slash regulatory uh, process itself. So. Yeah, I think it's an interesting approach, and you know, I take your point. GPT three by OpenAI, it's, it's it's very powerful, right? It's a very powerful service, and obviously, you know, we could probably expect some levels of quantum leap uh, going forward in terms of you know these types of technologies. But and I take your point uh, is that for building a business around it, it might actually be the integration into existing processes, especially if you're kind of designed towards enterprise, that is actually the real sort of competitive advantage and your ability to kind of, you know, map out those particular services. Um, we're quite short of time, so I'm just, I'm just going to skip forward to the last one, Eva, which I think is like a, quite an interesting company. It's like one of the ones that stood out to me just because, I, you know, we've seen lots of um, activity in the drone space. We've seen many hardware manufacturers. We've seen uh, many end, end users in this case, for example, on the, on the B2B side, whether it be kind of like Amazons of the world uh, or even in China, uh, implementing drones. Obviously, the drone infrastructures piece should be you know, a very interesting space. And you know, Eva has a solution that seemed you know, at the, on the face like quite comprehensive. The team itself seemed quite interesting, a bunch of ex-Tesla guys as well. So, you know, it's a very analogous market, you know, from electric cars towards building out, uh, you know, underlying infrastructure to power electric cars. Um, what do you think is attractive about like this, this particular market? And, and uh, you know, what do you, what do you think about when you kind of evaluate what the long-term potential is? I think one thing that I noticed of Viva, which actually applies a lot of the hardware company in these days, is that they take hardware as a service, right? You know, five, 10 years ago, people see that hardware is a single unit generating one of revenue, but now people are moving away from that model. And then drone and along with actually a lot of other hardware products, it's, it's actually not easy to implement, right? It's easy to buy one product, but to implement it across a thousand, it's actually fairly challenging. So it's actually becoming more like a, a SaaS model, right? So one thing that I like about EFI is that they start to think a lot about sort of the recurring bit of the, of the, business, of the revenue generation, right? Uh, and of course, drone is something that is actually not easy to manage, right? And you can imagine this to expand to a lot of other related businesses. It could be delivery, it could be just surveillance, it could be just infrastructure monitoring. So the, the potential is actually fairly large. And just perfect. And and thanks. And and just to add, add, on, add on to that, I think the overall vision for for drone or drone imagery is that um, you, you know how like we have different sort of sensors these days. We have IoT sensors. Um, so in terms of mapping out our whole world, we have satellite data at, at the very top. We have sensors or sensory IoT data at, at, at the very granular level. But then we are missing the so-called an aerial view of the whole space. And it's difficult to, to have a drone fly around and just collect aerial data. So in the future, I think that would be one of the key enablers of smart cities, of, uh, of this thing called the digital twin, which maps out how a, a smart city should behave. So I think it's, uh, it's one of the key, key enablers for, 
so, for so-called the future generations of both AI, quantum, and, and, and different things. But then we sort of need that uh, regulatory perspective solved because it's not like we can just fly a drone by ourselves and collect data. So it takes time. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I like his space for a lot of those reasons. Um, I tend to look at it more from the delivery perspective on this on this one um, because I, there are people moving in that space already um, and you can kind of start to see where some of the applications will be. Um, I agree. Actually, the exciting part, well, I, I like the hardware as a service. It's kind of AWS of, uh, of kind of, you know, these kind of devices that are moving through space. I actually really like the platform, uh, the the idea of a platform for the regulation of this aerospace. Airspace. Um, so they're kind of positioned a little bit for that. Um, if they get really, if they're really excellent, excellent at managing the assets, um, at the very least, they're you know a trade sale to Amazon or to Alibaba or something like that. Um, but these guys are really they're kind of solving that problem and how to scale how to scale this stuff. And I think that's a really interesting place to be. Now, maybe one final thought maybe on, on uh, Eva. One thing that stood out to me was, um, you know, this is a company that didn't seem like it was based in any particular place. Like the team was in Paris, I think, at the time they spoke in. The headquarters, I think, are in Brooklyn. But, you know, they are expanding city by city. And I think maybe that is kind of what's interesting about it, right? Because, you know, for the whole smart city approach, um, we could be moving into an era where you actually have, you know, legitimate competition between cities itself. And I think that's one of the trends that emerges out of this pandemic, where actually now remote working is very much part of the culture. People can choose to be where they where to be located. And forward thinking, you know, municipalities that kind of implement, you know, uh, approaches that allow uh, encouraging, you know, building of drone infrastructure, you know, might be you know, a trend of the future. So um, in any case, I think this has been a really robust discussion. I'm sorry we had to kind of rush through it, but I think we made it just under time. Um, so I think this ends a portion where of the judges panel where we uh, where we discuss the the startup finalists. So thank you very much to the judges. You know I think you guys, it's very clear that you guys are all very experienced uh, you know VC investors, and I hope that actually a lot of the the startups, you know when, when you participated, whether or not you make it into kind of the the final thirteen or the final eight. Um, you had an opportunity to kind of pitch to some of like the most experienced investors in the region. And hopefully, you know, you garnered some level of discussion from the Q and A, maybe from today as well about how people think about, you know, the various opportunities and evaluate them. So for now, um, what I would like to do, can we move on to the next slide as well? Uh, I am going to open up the, the voting for the final eight finalists. So we're moving down from the 13 selected semifinalists down to eight. And that eight will be decided by you uh, based on your uh, votes. Thank you, judges. So you must select eight out of 13 candidates below. And uh, it must be eight. Any more or any less will not be counted. I know it's uh, you can, can do that on a Zoom poll, but you know we are limiting it to the eight. And uh, voting will be open for the next 30 minutes. And uh, also, I would like to uh, also ask if there are any of the finalists who are actually uh, on the Zoom call right now, if you could actually rename yourself to, uh, to the following, if you could put the ATEC finalist, ATEC finalist with your company name, and then we'll be able to find you on the Zoom call. And once the uh, results are available, we will be able to, uh, to put you up on screen briefly so you can uh, wave, wave hello. So for now, I think what we'll do, uh, do we want to play the videos first? Actually, wanna, do we want to play the videos first? Uh, okay, sure. So now I'd like to invite onto stage uh, Danny Lee. Sure. So Danny is a partner at Blue Pool Capital. He's also a member of our ATEC Advisory Council. And he was also a judge of the inaugural ATEC Startup Competition in uh, 2019. So uh, welcome, Danny. You know, thank, thank you, you for all your uh, participation and assistance. So um, I guess maybe just to start off with, you know, as a previous judge, uh, 
and having kind of viewed this now, maybe having had an opportunity to look through to the various pitches that we put online, um, what do you think about uh, the the level, the quality of the startup participants this year? Did anything stand out to you in terms of like their uh, their focus, the maturity level, um, you know, the types uh, of their pitches that they provided? Um, yeah, I think uh, the interesting aspect I find is that uh, every year there are kind of new trends, uh, a new focus points uh, for everyone. Um, and it's always good to see that the uh, the companies uh, be able to catch up to that uh, and they are kind of leading and then coming up with the, the latest and the greatest. Uh, for example, you know, uh, I think this year, one of the big topics that we hear quite a bit in the investment community is, you know, ESG and things like that. And you have companies that are coming up with, you know, the, in terms of food tech, in terms of solutions, kind of going for the future. I think there's a there's a one with the um, the fish, you know, the the, the technology. And that was kind of, kind of interesting because um, in the past we've seen a lot of kind of planned technology, and now people want moving on into you know the second innovation of uh, protein innovation. So not just kind of meat, not just eggs, but now into into fishery and things like that. So I thought that was interesting and in, in trying to solve you know bigger world problems. And as you guys mentioned, there's a lot of, you know, drone, there's AI, there's all of this. Um, I like it because I, I'm, I'm seeing people finding uh, practical solutions. Um, I think two years ago, three years ago, AI was just a big word. Everything was an AI. But today you're actually seeing concrete solutions of what people are doing with AI and what they're trying to solve. So I think that's, that's always a good move. Yeah, it's interesting to see kind of the emergence of specific verticals, I think, within each kind of, you know, uh, segment. Are there, are there any kind of verticals that stand out to you and maybe not just with these participants themselves, but what you look for as a, as a VC investor? Is it, are there any sort of trends that you pay particular attention to? Um, I, I think uh, in terms of trends that I've seen over the last, let's say, 12 months, I would say there are two that stands out. Uh, but it's a, it's actually quite interesting. I would say it's very different. One is a U.S. more of a Western trend. One is more of a China trend. It's very and they kind of don't cross at this point. So what I mean is, if you look at the Western world, uh, I think crypto over the last six to twelve months is the hottest thing for sure. Like everyone's talking about it, everyone's looking at it, everyone's chasing it. Uh, but in China. The, the most interesting uh, things that we've seen is actually it has nothing to do with crypto <laughs> for obvious reasons, I guess. Um, but it's more about export. Uh, and this is export. It's not about, oh, let's go sell more you know, dishes and then computers to the rest of the world. It's about uh, having China is the, still the manufacturing base, but using technology, using social media to sell more stuff, to get more information from the consumers and what they want and react quickly and using and leveraging the existing manufacturing to supply the world. Uh, and that's a very clearly a China trend. And there's a lot of companies, a lot of verticals coming out of this that, uh, that are really hot right now. So in, in China, we will see companies that come out that either service these companies. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure you guys heard of uh, Xi'in, which is you know, one of the hottest companies in China right now. I don't think they ever raise money, actually, because <laughs> they, they're actually profitable. They're doing really well. Uh, and there are a lot of companies that come up in payment, in logistics, in warehousing that kind of support all of this huge trend. Um, and these companies are being chased uh, in the VC world at, at very high valuations. Uh, so to me, it's completely two different things. Uh, you know, in, in the West, NFT, you know, Dapper Labs, those are the things that people are talking about now. Uh, in China, something's slightly different. That's interesting. I mean, maybe we just stay on that point a little bit. I think, you know, traditionally, um, there has been a view that, you know, when investing in sort of looking at business models built out in Asia and China, there's a little bit of a time machine effect, right? And the people would look at, you know, developed countries, developed markets like the US and Europe, right? Identify interesting business models. And then potentially kind of translate it here with underlying, uh, you know, presumption that, you know, China is, five to 10 years behind where the U.S. is and Southeast Asia is five to 10 years behind where China is. But, you know, based on the comments that you just mentioned and this kind of like bifurcation, a little bit of very, very different kind of uh, opportunity sets. Do you think that's still valid or is that true? Well and truly dead, this, this idea of the time machine? Yeah, I, I think that's well and truly dead. Uh, <laughs> but what I'm seeing is the other way around, probably. Uh, I think Chinese companies are clearly ahead of the U.S. companies in terms of innovation in terms of business models, uh, in terms of e-commerce. 
um, we are, uh, I would say, probably 12 to 18 months ago, we were starting to see U.S. media companies trying to use this tipping as a revenue model. In China, obviously, we all know that's, you know, billions of dollars have been in that. And in the West, people are still going, does that still work? You know, like no, no one, you know, I saw one company that kind of started to do that and they had to convince people. Um, so I think that, you know, using TikTok, like Show and Biden, you know, all of this, using them to uh, monetize, right? T attaching e-commerce to that. That is Chinese companies leading the way, not American companies leading the way. Uh, so I, I think that's, you know, kind of dead in the sense that, you know, Chinese companies are always following the U.S. Uh, lead. Uh, I think today Alibaba, Tencent, uh, ByteDance, you know, all of these guys are, are definitely leading the way in terms of, you know, um, 5G technologies as well and all of that. Um, I think the, the U.S. still have some hardcore technology that is still uh, ahead of China. And, and that, they, that's from, you know, the last 50 years of investments. So in terms of semiconductors, in terms of lithography, all of the stuff is still, the West is still leading the way. And China is trying to desperately to catch up. But in terms of the typical model that you and I always hear about in terms of innovation and that, I think the Chinese companies are, are, are moving way faster. Uh, they, they're also innovating a lot faster than the U.S. companies. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting point because uh, I guess what I notice, you know, s some part of this innovation is, especially on the Chinese side, um, kind of veers into the, uh, the cultural sphere, right? Which is something that, you know, you would not have anticipated, you would not have predicted. I mean, if you look at things like, you know, Fortnite and the idea of the metaverse, you know, there are a lot of companies in China that actually kind of predated that, right? The idea of like loot boxes, the, you know, the monetization of those models. So it's pretty interesting to see it sort of, you know, bleed through and, you know, to see the average Chinese consumer think like, oh, you know, a lot of the stuff that you're seeing developed here, we had that, uh, you know, Clubhouse, for example, right? Clubhouse says, you know, example, like our audio came and went, like it, you know, it died on the vine in China because it was pretty basic. Uh, so, but actually to your point about, uh, innovation and the, the types of innovation. Maybe let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, the role of Hong Kong, the role of the Greater Bay Area, um, and just this idea around innovation. Um, you know, they're trying to, there's been lots of talk about it, especially, I guess, in, within Hong Kong, but also in the broader aspect of the Greater Bay of reinventing itself across a number of different spheres, you know, moving away from just manufacturing, but into kind of true innovation, you know, for example, life sciences, you know, high focus on that. Um, I, I thought it was interesting. I, I, uh, there's a book by Matt Ridley called How Innovation Works, right? And, you know, one of the things that he mentions is innovation is more than just invention, right? Invention is the act of like creating something new, but innovation is the ability to basically, you know, take a creative reconfiguration of multiple inventions and, you know, forge that in and in ideas into something new and practical uh, and in some cases, you know, commercial. And in many respects, you know, the U.S. has always led the way in terms of innovation. And China has always been branded as kind of like a me too, you know, economy, a copycat economy. But when you think about actually the ability to, you know, this redefinition of innovation to take multiple in inventions, scale them. Uh, it's hard to think of like another place in the world that does it better than China. And I think in this pandemic era, I think a lot of that has been, it's a stark contrast. I think that's made, been made very apparent. So, you know, given that, what do you think is, you know, maybe the fallout from the pandemic? with respect to how investors think about innovation and the various places in the world it kind of comes from. And what do you think, this is a big, long question, but like from a public policy perspective, what can we do more to encourage innovation here in the Greater Bay Area? Okay, so um, maybe let, let me address the point of uh, innovation as well. You, you brought up a very interesting point. I think in order for kind of proliferation of innovation to happen, you need to have some basic uh, factors that are in place. Uh, I think one of them is just basically having a educated population, having a wealthy enough population, having a population that is willing to uh, experiment, um, that has the money and the time to experiment, to try new different things. And that's how, you know, a lot of these that gets taken up because innovation only becomes something that we all are aware of when it becomes popular. Like otherwise, it's just sitting in some lab. No one knows about it. There's plenty of innovations that we know nothing about. Um, so I think in China, what happens is, if you look at the last 20 years, that's exactly what happened to the Chinese society, right? The people have become 
a lot richer. They have a lot more uh, disposable income. Um, so the Chinese, the average Chinese person today is very, very different from the average Chinese person 30 years ago. Um, they have money, they travel, they know what's going on. They no longer purely believe that all the Western brands are the only the best brands. They're actually now going for their own brands. Um, you can see that in a lot of you know alcoholic brands, fashion brands, things like that as well. So I think that's what's, uh, that's what changed. It, it, I think innovation has always been there because innovation is just like you said, it's, it's kind of some, started with invention in, in you know, universities. And in, in the U.S., they obviously have the best universities sucking people from the, all over the world. China has a lot of people too, so they can do all that. But you've historically seen a lot more innovations happening in the U.S. because the market is there. Right? People are willing to try. People are willing to buy a Tesla. Right? But today, China is that market, not so much the U.S. Uh, so I think you will continue to see more quote unquote innovation out of China because the market is just there for, to accept it. Um, I think then your second question is about kind of, you know, whether or not the, the, the pandemic kind of drove some of this. Um, I would say for sure. Uh, it definitely, I think this people already talked about, so I don't need to repeat it. It's just, it pushed through a lot of things, at least on the online distance, that kind of thing. Uh, are people much more willing? To, to try different things now. Uh, for example, I used to travel all the time <laughs> on the plane. Like, I mean, how many of us are flying now? No, I haven't, I haven't flown in a year and a half. And I actually don't miss it that much, to be honest. I, uh, I'm a little bit worried for the airline because I think uh, after this, uh, people like me who kind of contribute 80% of their net profits are probably not going to fly that much. Um, I think hotels, you know, uh, that kind of thing still might come back. Um, but I, I honestly think business travel will have some issues because now everyone's sort of used to doing this, right? It's, it's nothing wrong. It's so convenient. I hit a button, I get on, I do my thing. So, um, it's, it's interesting to see what's going to happen. Um, uh, but that's more of a, a, a habit that, that literally I never thought that I would change, but I can totally see myself changing. Um, and the, I think the, uh, being Hong Kong in the greater Bay, I think Hong Kong needs to be part of a bigger region. Um, I think Hong Kong, it's always been the people, uh, it's always been the people, to me, it's all, everything's driven by people. Um, the U.S. was one of the strongest countries in the world because they were able to attract the best people from all over the world. No country can say that in the last 50 years. Uh, that might change going forward. Um, we don't know how it's going to change. I think China needs to do a better job of attracting the talent to them as well. I think Hong Kong certainly in the green grand scheme of things, needs to attract more people from the Greater Bay Area into Hong Kong, uh, or maybe the other way around, you know, kind of work into that area. That means on the ground that Hong Kong graduates needs to go to China, needs to go to Shenzhen, uh, and which can attract people from Shenzhen coming to Hong Kong as well, because Hong Kong certainly have some benefits in terms of tax, in terms of, you know, um, conditions and living and all that. Um, but there needs to be a real interaction i think right now there's a lot of talk but people are not quite sure uh, exactly what to do with this greater bay area i think it starts with um having people kind of flow back and forth right now obviously it's difficult <laughs> given the, given the pandemic but um you need to make it more of a, a one area such that people from Shenzhen can kind of hop on over like you know i used to live in brooklyn in new york it's like me going to manhattan it has to be like that <laughs> yeah. it has to be that simple it has to be that easy uh, and then I think then, then Hong Kong can truly melt into that uh, Greater Bay Area. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. And obviously, you know, in current times notwithstanding, um, I think what you're saying is the, the hardware infrastructure, the hardware integra integration is already here, actually. There, if you wanted to, and I know this, I know this personally, you could, uh, we used to have to travel you know, up to two hours to get to you know, one of our locations in Shenzhen. And now you could do that 30 minutes door to door, assuming the high speed rail is open. So the actual infrastructure is there, but kind of the software, the wetware, the cultural uh, shift probably still needs to, to happen. Yeah, it, it will take a bit of time. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Because right now I can go to Guangzhou in 45 minutes. It used to take me two and a half hours. Um, so it's, you know, from Brooklyn to lower, lower East Side, it takes an hour by train, <laughs> by, by, you know, by, by subway. So this is already faster than that. Um, I think there needs to be more uh, talent switching between the two. Um, and I think Hong Kong absolutely has the, the, the benefits to do that. I mean, you know, one is the tax. I mean, uh, let's be honest. Most of us are here because this is place is low tax. That's why all the finance companies are here. Uh, I think the government has done a pretty good job 
on that front. Um, I sit on a committee that kind of provides policy advice to the government as well. And I think that's, that's one of the things, you know, tax is definitely up there. I would say talent. Um, there are various countries, like, you know, like countries like New Zealand, like other places that have talent programs that actively, you know, promote giving uh, residency for people who want to come or for talent that people want to come. I think that's a very smart thing. Um, you know, we should do the same. Yeah, I think that earlier point before about sort of competition between city states, I think that's coming. I mean, that's pretty much clear. You see it in the U.S. where Miami, for example, is now attracting tons of sort of tech talent and a lot of it's basically led top down. You have countries like Texas, too. I follow Texas. You have Estonia or Estonia, right, doing something similar. Um, I think this is alluded to earlier on as well. But let's talk a little bit like uh, how important the alumni effect happens to be. Right. So when you look at the your construction of you know the different sort of Bay areas like the San Francisco Bay Area, if you look at like the New York tri-state area um, or even Tokyo, the development of like their entrepreneurial ecosystem, um, you could look at it as sort of different phases. You had you know the when you, when you start having a real broad-based boom, what preceded that was you had a couple of like you know very high-profile unicorns or sort of champions. And that essentially produced an entire kind of middle range of like entrepreneurial talent that came out and seeded the next generation. So how important do you think that is here in the Great Bay Area? And do we have the seeds of that now? I'm thinking about companies like, for example, Tencent, right? Uh, or even kind of like uh, Be uh, the genomic company in Beijing. <laughs> Dropping my mind right now, but other other various companies, DGI for example, right? Companies that have you know made high progress, probably uh, made a lot of their employees financially secure enough that they can then become sort of investors, advisors, founders, technical founders. Do we have the seeds of that now? How far along do you think we are uh, in that? No, I, I think we absolutely had that seed. It's it's already there. There's a lot of you know, like I said, Tencent, Alibaba, Baidu, uh, ByteDance, Kwai Show, all of these guys. Um, you know, they made a multi billionaires out of <laughs> hundreds and thousands of people. And a lot of these people are now already investing in the VC community. They have set up their own funds. I personally know quite a few people who, who left those companies and started their own funds and started investing, uh, people who left and start their own companies. Um, so I think that, you know, the, the ecosystem is alive and well, I mean, China on this point, I think it's, it's working really, really well. Uh, I think Hong Kong needs a bit more of that push. Um, I think Hong Kong is a small market, um, but Hong Kong can, but um, I can almost say almost, I, I don't know the data for this, but I would venture a guess that more than half of the billionaires in China have some connection to Hong Kong, if not more than that. So, um, you know, we have these people here, they are part, some part of it in Hong Kong for whatever reason, um, and we, we could definitely use that uh, as well. Let's talk a little bit, maybe let's wrap up the conversation a little bit and maybe, you know, bring it on home, make it a little bit more concrete. I think there are a lot of people who are attending Zoom today are either startup participants or people who are interested in that particular sphere. Uh, as someone who kind of meets with, invests in, um, engages and mentors lots of different sort of, you know, entrepreneurial uh, companies and teams, like what sort of advice would you give them? What would, and then specifically in the context of this market, what would you say uh, are the important things that they should kind of be aware of that, you know, if you were to meet them with them and invest with them, that to be top of mind for you? When you say this market, you mean Hong Kong in particular or? What, Hong Kong and Greater Bay Area. Like, for example, if there are startups here, right? What is the kind of like the most actionable piece of advice that you could kind of give to them and, um, I, I, I say there, uh, I think there's a book called Startup Nation uh, that talks about the Israeli innovation system and how that's developed. Uh, I think Hong Kong kind of reminds me of places like Israel or Sweden. Uh, by definition, very small markets, right? So Sweden has what I think eight million. It's probably the same size in terms of population, similar size. Uh, and they have, I think someone mentioned Klarna and all these guys. Um, if you look at their startup system. Day one, those guys don't design their company to work for Sweden. They design a company to work for the world uh, or Europe at, at the very least. I think the first thing I say for people who are building companies in Hong Kong, you know, is, is you got to think about at least all of China. Uh, 
it's probably it's difficult to think of the world now, but China's enough. China's a big enough market for you to for you to do well. So you need to think bigger. Can't just solve a problem that's a local problem. Uh, that won't make you very big. Or as I think you mentioned before, if you do that, then you better hope somebody acquires you. <laughs> but that's probably not the best strategy uh, to start your company. Um, but I think mentality is very important. So if you have to look at, you know, Israelis, you have to look at the, the Swedes, you know, they do it for the world. They stay, day one, they start thinking big. They start planning big. Um, they have offices in, in, in different places. Uh, they have people from all over the, uh, all over the European region or, or you know, all over the world. Um, I think you need that kind of hunger. You need that kind of uh, global vision. Um, and then the second thing I would say is, um, at the end of the day, uh, people need to uh, need to think about kind of, I think, unit economics, commercial. It still needs to be sustainable. Right? This is not a charity. Um, even if you say, okay, I'm, I'm selling you know, views right now, mm. uh, ultimately that view has to turn into some profit for, for people to, to, for you to truly survive. Um, and I think the last thing I would say is I think the, the world has changed uh, a little bit um, in the sense that... Uh, there are now very established companies, the names of which we already talked about many times, out there, both in China and in the U.S. Uh, so this is very different, let's say, from year 2000 when I was starting to invest. There was no big company. I mean, all the companies were big SOEs and they were sleepy, so they didn't know what the hell was going on. Uh, but today, you have so many companies that have so much resources that kind of looking at you. Uh, the moment you kind of sprung up with anything, they would probably come and I had to try to buy you out. <laughs> uh, so you have to, I, I think people have to have a, um, in their own mind, a decision point as well is in case you succeed to a certain point, are you going to continue on your own or are you, are, are you going to, you know, sell yourself out to a, a, a bigger company and be part of that? That's something that I think probably happened only in the last 10 years. Uh, but it, it is something that's driving the, the venture community quite a bit. Um, so I think for, you know, for, for new companies that they should think about all of these things. Well, thank you, Danny. I think like I think you make uh, some very important points. And actually, when listening to you and reflecting on both, you know, the judges panel discussion, what we saw from the companies, I feel like most of the the finalists that we uh, encountered over this process kind of typify what you're saying, right? I think a lot of I think to your initial comment about the quality, uh, it feels like a lot of these startups now are attempting to solve very large problems, right? in innovative ways. And, you know, certainly I think uh, another big leap is their commercial acumen, right? They're kind of quite realistic about like what their views are. So, you know, I think this is just an example of the ongoing maturity kind of the startup ecosystem here. Yeah. So, but in any case, thank you very much, Danny. Thank, thank you for your thoughts. Thanks for participating with ATEC and your support all this time. Um, as for now, I believe, uh, are we, Seven more minutes to close. To close voting, should we uh, should we run the videos now? Then, yeah. So what we'll do is we're going to run some videos from our sponsors. Uh, earlier, I was a bit remiss. Uh, I forgot to mention UBS is one of our primary sponsors as well. So thank you to to, to UBS. Uh, and right now we'll. Uh, so one more time for the uh, the actual finalists themselves. If you are one of the thirteen companies. Could, and you are on the Zoom call right now. Uh, if you don't mind, could you rename yourself to, in all caps, ATEC finalist, followed by your company name? And uh, if you do that, we'll be able to find you and locate you and pull you up on screen um, once the voting is complete. Welcome to the 2021 Asia Technology Entrepreneurship Conference. My name is Thomas Chow. I'm a partner and the co-head of Asia Private Equity at Morrison & Forrester. On behalf of the firm, we're thrilled to be sponsoring ATEC again this year as we have in the past. For all those companies presenting today, I wish you good luck.
Well, voting is closed and the results are in. And uh, we're, <laughs> we're just about to, uh, to bring the finalists on board. Do we, do we have a graphic as to the uh, who's, are we ready? I can say this though, the, uh, the voting was incredibly close. So I think for, uh, for any of the 13 who, uh, all 13 uh, contestants should feel very, very pleased. Um, so that was, that was not the winners, that was just the, the full 13 that was on there. But uh, as I was saying, the results are very, very close. So, you know, it was a very small margin that separated uh, a lot of these uh, these companies. In fact, the, the many who actually ended up having the same vote tally as each other. So all 13 finalists should feel very pleased with themselves in terms of uh, their ability to uh, to convince a broader audience about uh, the value of the, you know, uh, the, the startups that they're creating and the problems that they're solving. doing uh, this is this is a the benefit of doing things live <laughs> yeah this is uh this is the oscars of uh <laughs> startup competitions right it's a high wire act doing stuff live um okay do we have a graphic that we can put up on screen just of like the the companies or no no just the eight. So, so the final the final eight winners are in alphabetical order, no particular order, just alphabetical. Are Avant, what? Genie Biome, Giga Cover, Hong Kong Deco Man, Lifespans. One degree, pick up, and zero. So congratulations, congratulations to all eight finalists. Congratulations again also to their sponsoring alumni clubs. Uh, as you can see, a very kind of widespread. So, you know, I think it speaks well to kind of the alumni community in terms of generating uh, innovative uh, companies in their network. But once again, congratulations to. So, congratulations to these eight finalists. And what I'd like to do now is I'd like to invite, who are, most of them I believe are on the Zoom call right now. I invite you, if you are one of these eight finalists, to please turn on your video. And, uh, you know, we, are, we will try to bring you live on screen so you can uh, wave hello. So if you, once again, if you are one of these eight, please turn your camera on. How are we doing? Are we seeing any happy faces? So once again, these are the eight finalists that will be uh, presenting uh, to our live conference in September. Uh, to, uh, once again, our panel of uh, VC judges, they will once again pitch and also uh, participate in a judges Q&A uh, and once again it will be a live audience vote to select who will be the ATEC startup competition winner for this year for ATEC 2021 so hopefully by that point uh, we will have live in-person events hopefully there'll be less friction in terms of travel and we'll be able to have all of these uh, participants in live in person but for now, I would all I would settle just for having their faces on screen. That would be. <laughs> In any case, while we're waiting, I think maybe I'll just um, I'd just like to spend the time doing so a few closing remarks and just to spend the time thanking once again our esteemed judging panel. 
uh, for their time and effort over the last several weeks, and also for their, their competence and expertise and being so willing to kind of share your time. I would like to thank all the startup participants from the, the 100, the over 100 entries that we received to the 25 companies that actually pitched live to our judges, to the 13 who were selected and to the final eight who are now here on screen. Um, I'd like to thank also our alumni club community, which numbers like well over 35 regional alumni clubs uh, and their various startup captains who helped uh, select and nominate all the various companies and help shepherd their startups through the uh, competition process. I'd like to send a big thank you, of course, to our sponsors, uh, Marston Forster, Baker McKenzie, UBS, and of course, our event partner, CyberPort. Uh, without their you know, flexibility and broad range of resources, much of today's events and all the previous events would not have been possible. Uh, and finally, I'd also like to thank our ATEC organizing community, committee, which has been kind of a volunteer group, has soldiered through all the various kind of trials and tribulations of trying to launch a conference in these interesting times. So finally, we have, uh, we have, our, uh, we have four of our uh, startup participants here. We have Frank Yao from uh, Zero. Hi, Frank. We have Francis Chan from Genie Biome. Congratulations. Amerson Lin from Giga Cover. And we have Siwang from uh, Genie Biome. So wave hello, guys. You know, congratulations once again. You know, we had a... I mean, hopefully you, uh, you tuned in for mo much of the discussion, which I thought was pretty robust on, uh, on behalf of kind of the VC judges. Uh, maybe you came away with some kind of takeaways from that, but we will certainly be seeing you as well, hopefully live in person um, in September when you kind of pitch to our uh, live audience, live and online uh, as well. So once again, maybe a big hand for our uh, eight finalists, including the four who are on screen right now. And we'll see you guys soon. So finally, uh, could we switch to the, uh, the end title page, please? Um, I'd just like to plug our, our final event. So just a reminder, all this is building up to, <laughs> especially for our ATEC organizers, uh, has been building up to our, our final event, ATEC 2021. Knock on wood, uh, will be a live conference uh, held as a hybrid event on Saturday, September 25th here at Cyberport, um, which will feature the startup competition finals. We will have, uh, our, with live judges, we ha will have panels of various speakers, as well as a networking cocktail and uh, several keynotes. So, you know, please save the date, mark your calendars, and uh, we look forward to seeing you all uh, in September. So thank you very much. Thanks for attending today. And, uh, you know, once again, um, thanks, for, thanks for your attention. Thank you very much.